Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Christo Buizert, but I'm here on behalf of the whole Waste Divide project. And the Waste Divide is a ice core very recently drilled by the US Antarctic program. Uh, the work that we're presenting um, synthesizes many records that come from many different laboratories. Um, and also it represents the efforts of the entire community rather than just a few individuals. So this is the full list of authors that I couldn't all get into the AGU abstract. Okay. So a bit about the Waste Divide ice core. So this is an uh, ice core that was finished very recently by the US Antarctic program. So it's an, an acronym for the West Antarctic Ice Sheet Divide. And the core is uh, 3,400 meters long, so it's a pretty deep core, um, to 50 meters above bedrock, and it was stopped above bedrock to prevent contamination of the, um, of the basal hydrology. It has a high accumulation. That's going to be important further down the line. And it's located here on the Western Arctic Divide, very close to the bird station. Okay. Um, so I'll be talking about the bipolar seesaw, and I think we're all probably familiar with this, but just to recap it a little bit, the upper fig figure here shows a schematic overview of the uh, global overturning circulation, and we'll be focusing mostly here on the Atlantic branch. The lower plot shows reanalysis data, and it shows the heat transport by the different ocean basins. And in this figure, a positive number means northward heat transport. And as you can see here, the Atlantic is actually quite unique in that it has northward heat transport at all latitudes, which means that the Atlantic overturning circulation directly uh, exchanges heat between both hemispheres. And so if you would perturb or slow down this Atlantic branch of the overturning circulation, you could affect climate on both hemispheres. And this is the schematic bipolar seesaw model. The upper graph here is Greenland. So this is a schematic picture here of the DO events. You see rapid warmings and rapid coolings. And at the same time, Antarctica has a much more muted response. And the, and the AIM events, as we call them, Antarctic isotopic maxima, have some sort of a triangular shape. And during periods when it's cold in Greenland, Antarctica is warming, and vice versa. When it's warm in Greenland, Antarctica tends to be cooling. And this sort of muted response is in this simple model by Stocker and Johnson um, is explained by a big, large heat reservoir, for example, the Southern Ocean, that buffers these changes that happen in the Atlantic. So these are the new records that we have from Waste Divide. Up here is the North Cape Delta 18O as a proxy for Greenland temperature. This is the new methane record that was obtained from Waste Divide. And you can see it's an extremely high resolution record. And even these sort of minor DO events, such as 17 and 16, which are composed of a bunch of little ones, are really well represented and really well resolved in this methane record. Also, this is actually the low resolution methane record from Waste Divide. We have another record which is obtained f uh, through uh, continuous flow analysis, which has centimeter scale resolution. I'll show a bit of that later. Um, this is the isotopes from Waste Divide, and we see the same kind of patterns that you see all over Antarctica. So this is an East Antarctic stack, a stack of five East Antarctic ice cores, and all the events correlate really well with the, with the rest of Antarctica. And it really shows that these AIM events are a uh, signal that's seen across the continent. It's a pan-Antarctic signal. So what I'll be looking at is the precise timing of northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere climate. So if I go back, um, typically what we do to synchronize these ice cores, if we want to look at the relative phasing, we need to synchronize these two records, and that's done via this methane record. Because this is a record, um, methane is, is a global signal, so we can measure it both in Antarctica and in Greenland, so we can use this to synchronize the, the chronology of both ice cores. So I'll be looking at the uh, phasing of the bipolar seesaw and try to get more precise constraints on it. And the reason is, if we know the precise timing of both the, the climate on both, uh, both hemispheres, we can say something about leads or lags in the system, the direction of propagation, and also the mode by which it's propagated. So the type of signals that propagate the, the signals between the hemispheres. And the sort of um, atmospheric teleconnections or atmospheric processes typically act on short time scales, so seasonal to decadal scales. Whereas any oceanic processes related to the overturning are probably much slower, so decadal to multi-millennial time scales. Um, so the question now becomes, how is this signal transported between the hemispheres? And if you, this is a sort of a schematic picture of the overturning circulation of the AMOC branch. So it's a slow current moving north, sinking, formation of North Atlantic deep water, which then moves south. The time for freshly formed North Atlantic deep water to be exported to the Southern Ocean, where it could potentially influence the climate, is actually several hundred years. 
So that's a long time scale, but there's quicker mechanisms by which these signals could be propagated in the ocean. And a good analog may be just a light system in any house. If you, if you hit a light switch, the light turns off pretty much instantaneously. Despite the fact that the electrons that carry the current travel at about one meter per hour, so they go really slow. And the reason is that the moment you hit the light switch, you, um, there's an electromagnetic wave that travels to the, lights, to the light bulb, which tells the currents to readjust. So the question is, if we hit the light switch in the North Atlantic, when does the light go off in, in Antarctica? So in the case here, you don't have to wait for this whole currents to make it. The, travel can be, uh, the signal can be propagated via Kelvin waves, which need a zonal boundary to propagate. So they can propagate along the zonal boundary here, across the equator, and they can influence the South Atlantic on pretty short time scale. And this is also what Steve Barker has shown in his, in his paper, is that the South Atlantic responds actually quite abruptly and within dating uncertainties almost instantaneously with climate change in the North Atlantic. However, once you get to the latitudes here of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, you no longer have this type of zonal boundary. So the, the, the modeling suggests that the propagation across the Antarctic Circumpolar, circumpolar Current is actually what takes longer, so centennial timescales. So the reason we do that waste divide is, is actually twofold. First of all, we have the, this is maybe a bit technical, but ice cores have a difference between the age of the gases and the ice, the ice age, gas age difference, or delta age, which is really small at waste divide. So this is a logarithmic scale, and this sort of uh, dome C has a, uh, has a, a delta age of about 3,000 years. At waste divide, it's only about 400. So if the uncertainty in delta age is about 20%, you can imagine that the phasing that we derive at waste divide is about an order of magnitude more accurate than you could do it at sites in East Antarctica. Also, as I said, we have these extremely high resolution methane records. This is North Grip Delta 18 This is the new centimeter scale methane record. And you can really see that all these events are really well resolved. Even, the sub, even on the centennial scale, there's, there's correlation between these records. The lower, these orange dots here, is the EDML methane record. And this is a really good record. It is the, so the best record available until very recently. And so you can see it's truly sort of a quantum leap in terms of data quality. We go from this sort of 100 centennial time scales to centimeter resolution on these methane records. So this helps us a lot in synchronizing these two records. So what we find is the following. So again, here's the schematic picture. And now I'm first going to look at one of those abrupt warmings. This is an abrupt warming in Greenland. And what I did to sort of reveal, there's quite a little bit of noise in this Delta 18O time series. So I stacked all the different events. I took all the 18 DO events in the record. I synchronized them all, and I aligned them at the midpoint of their methane transition. And then I averaged all the different events sort of to reveal the shared climatic signal between them. And what we see is here, the blue line is north grip, north grip temperature. The green line is methane measured in waste divide, and this is the isotope, so the temperature at waste divide. So what we find is a very pronounced sort of 200-year lag. North, the northern hemisphere, at least Greenland, starts to warm, and it takes about 200 years before Antarctica realizes what has happened. The same happens for these cooling events. So here I stacked all the cooling events in the northern hemisphere. So this is again, uh, blue is north grip, green is methane, and this is the warming response, again, delayed by about 200 years. You can do the same by just looking at the entire record. Here I take the cross correlation between the Greenland record and the derivative, the first time derivative of the Antarctic time series. And we find the largest anti-correlation here, again at the lag, southern hemisphere lag or northern hemisphere lead of about 200 years. So this result seems to be quite robust. To test it further, I did some sort of a, a Monte Carlo uh, simulation. And the uncertainty in the chronology is actually the largest contribution to the uncertainty. So I made 4,000 alternative chronologies for waste divide, just an ensemble that sort of uh, envelopes probably the true, true chronology. And I did a Monte Carlo simulation in which I sort of randomly perturbed the alignments of the individual events. And by doing so, we get sort of an uncertainty estimate. These are the values that we get. So for the warming in the Northern Hemisphere, the, the lead is about 220 years plus minus 90. Similar for the cooling, it's again about 200 years. So what, do we, what can we conclude from these observations? So first off, I think it's important to realize that there is a clear northern hemisphere lead in this bipolar seesaw. And I think this is consistent with any type of North Atlantic mechanism that you could propose. So clearly, these events are manifested first in the North Atlantic. 
Second, the propagation time is on centennial time scale, so about 200 years. And I think this suggests that it is um, this bipolar CISO, when we're looking at Antarctic temperatures, the signal is dominated by oceanic propagation of this climatic signal. Furthermore, I'm not sure if you, if you saw it in these, in these stacks, but if you look at the, the immediate response, any atmospheric contribution to the bipolar seesaw is expected to show up within decades probably from the northern hemisphere abrupt events, and we see nothing within the noise. So from this, we estimate some sort of an upper bound of 0.2 Kelvin on any atmospherically induced direct temperature changes in Antarctica, which should be compared to the magnitude of the events, which is about an order of magnitude larger. Um, the f fourth point I want to make here, we find an indistinguishable propagation time between the two, so between a northern hemisphere warming event and a northern hemisphere cooling event. So this suggests that the propagation time is completely independent on the background state of the AMOC. So it does not matter where you, whether you start in the collapsed AMOC state or in the more vigorous AMOC state. The propagation time is comparable. And this suggests, again, perhaps that it's linked to the strength of the Antarctic circumpolar current. This time lag of 200 years possibly or probably reflects propagation across the ACC, and so the ACC is presumably more stable on these time scales, which would explain why the time scale for this propagation does not depend on the warming or the cooling. Furthermore, uh, we do not find a difference in propagation time between the main, the major, and the smaller AIM events. So the major AIM events would be 4, 8, 12, 16, or the large events that are all preceded by a Heinrich event. So when it comes to the timing of the bipolar seesaw, we do not find a difference in the Heinrich and the non-Heinrich stadials. And I think this is consistent with the previous four talks. Um, the last point that I want to make is, again, here I showed a bunch of other stacks. This, remember, that at time zero, this is when the abrupt climate change happens in Greenland. The orange stack here shows the temperature of Antarctica. But I also showed here deuterium excess. And deuterium excess records atmospheric circulation to a large degree. And so what you see is that deuterium excess actually does respond almost instantaneously. So we find evidence at ways divide that there is both atmospheric and oceanic teleconnections. The temperatures in Antarctica are dominated by oceanic processes that are longer, uh, whereas the deuterium excess responds to the atmosphere, which changes almost instantaneously in response to the abrupt northern hemisphere event. And I would encourage you all, this deuterium excess work is all the work by Brad Markle, who is from uh, University of Washington, and he has a poster, so I would encourage you all to go, go see that poster. Um, so with that, I'd like to conclude, and if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them.